Welcome. The committee may come to will please come to order. I appreciate uh, all of you being here on this important topic today, and I thank those uh, for participants in advance. Uh, we want to welcome you to this hearing, which is entitled "Is This Any Way to Treat Our Troops?" Part Three: Transition Delays. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our military and intelligence community for their tireless efforts and heroism, as exemplified by the events of this past weekend. The fact that Osama bin Laden is no longer the leader of Al Qaeda is a victory for the United States and those who stand against terrorism. A dark chapter in the world history is now closed, but the, far, the fight is far from over. I hope we all take time to pause in our own, in our own way and recognize the victims that have been at the hands of this uh, tyrant, but also to thank the men and women who have served so tirelessly in the intelligence community, the, mil the military, uh, the families uh, that have poured their effort to fight the war on terrorism. Undoubtedly, that will continue. Uh, but we need to thank them in our own way, in our own hearts, and in our own communities. As America redoubles its efforts to defeat global terrorism, let us never forget the brave men and women of our armed forces who have brought us this far. They have sacrificed everything for us and have for generations. Since 2001, 6,014 Americans have died in operations Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, and New Dawn. Another 43,184 people have been injured during this time. In Afghanistan alone, these numbers have risen dramatically since our current President took office in 2009. You will see some charts here on the walls. The total number of deaths has risen from 155 in 2008 to 499 in 2010. The total number of injuries has more than doubled from 2,144 in 2008 to 5,226 in the year 2010. There have been 81 deaths and 854 injuries this year alone. Some wounds are visible and others are not, but we are all, but we're all acquired in the defense of our nation and serving our country. Just as our uniformed men and women took the oath of office to defend America, took the oath to defend the America, the Federal Government has a duty to provide care for them upon their return. Of the two, the Federal Government undeniably has the easier end of the equation, yet we struggle to get it right. This is why we are here today. Subcommittee will examine issues associated with the transition of wounded service members from the Department of Defense to the Department of Veterans Affairs. In recent years, various oversight bodies have identified significant shortcomings in the care and treatment of our veterans. These entities include the Government Accountability Office, the Independent Review Group commissioned by the Defense Secretary Gates, Inspectors General, as well as the Dole Shalala uh, Commission. Each has highlighted deficiencies in the administrative processing of wounded service members. A chief concern is the overly bureaucratic and lengthy disability evaluation system. The lack of seamless transition process is the source of great frustration for injured combat veterans and their families. Under the Legacy Disability Evaluation System, often referred to as DES, service members wait an average, an average of 540 days from the time they receive their medical evaluation from the Department of Defense to the time they receive a benefit check from the VA. Let me repeat that, 540 days. In some cases, this period is longer than the entire active duty enlistment. According to reports, there are a number of reasons for this delay. These include duplicative medical exams, poor IT infrastructure, the lack of staffing, and others. But after much criticism, departments agreed to revamp the DES. In 2007, a pilot program called the Integrated Disability Evaluation System was introduced. This program aimed to consolidate programs and eliminate the gap in benefits. The goal was to reduce the 540-day process to 295 days. The average wait, according to a briefing by DOD and VA committee staff, is now 335 days. While 335 days is far more profitable than 540 days, it is still too long. And some of the old problems have yet to be resolved. GAO will describe some of those challenges here today. We appreciate them being here with us. On March 17, 2011, Defense Secretary Gates and VA Secretary Shinseki agreed to examine ways to reduce the wait time to 75 to 150 days. They also agreed to devise an interagency inter electronic health information record. I am troubled it took until 2011 for these agreements to be reached. However, I do look forward to hearing from our administration witnesses about how each department plans to achieve these goals. With each new administration, there seems to be a renewed enthusiasm to address veterans' issues. And there is no doubt that the Department of Defense, the VA, and this President are well-intentioned and have veterans' interests, best interests at heart. 
But we must ensure that the Federal Government is working smartly at each step of the way. With the recent increases in the number of deaths and injuries in Afghanistan, we have to get this right. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses about the successes and challenges they face. The subcommittee is ready to work with the departments in whatever way possible to ensure the better care of our veterans. At this time, I would like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank also our ranking member who is on his way, Mr. Tierney, for convening this hearing today. I, too, uh, join you in saluting our troops, the CIA, and all those people involved, and certainly to the President of the United States, um, Mr. Obama, for what was done uh, over the last few days with regard to Osama bin Laden. Um, and I think it is quite appropriate, Mr. Chairman, that we sit here today addressing the issues confronting uh, people like the Navy SEALs, people like the young people who are right now at the United States Naval Academy in my state, and I serve on their board of visitors, um, who go out there, do their job to protect our freedom, our rights, and protect our people. And so I salute them and, um, and all those who were involved in that successful mission. Last month, I visited Walter Reed, uh, along with you, Mr. Chairman, and the Naval Medical Center to meet with our wounded warriors and their caregivers. We talked with an Army <coughs> sergeant who lost his legs in Helmand Province in Afghanistan, an Army captain who lost both legs and several fingers in eastern Afghanistan, and a young private from the Midwest who lost a leg and was there with his mother. And these are <coughs> very real costs of war. We owe our wounded warriors the very best health care when they return from the battlefield. For those of us sitting here and of those of you sitting at the witness table, it is our duty to make sure that the United States makes good on that promise. It is a very, very important promise. And I have often said that this is not, this must not be about politics. It must be about purpose. It must about, be about commitments that we have made to our men and women in, uh, in uniform. When the Washington Post published a series of articles in 2007 detailing the appalling conditions at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, I was angry and deeply embarrassed by the poor quality of care, the terrible conditions, and the bureaucratic obstacles facing our service members and veterans. In the previous Congress, this committee has taken an active role in holding DOD and VA responsible for improving the care of our wounded warriors. Representative Tierney, to his credit, held the very first hearing on this issue in the 110th Congress. And back then, I wasn't even on his subcommittee, but I appeared with him at his first committee hearing on that, subcommittee hearing on that, at Walter Reed. And Chairman Chaffetz, by holding today's hearing, you are demonstrating your commitment to continuing our committee's bipartisan commitment to this cause. This is a situation where Republicans and Democrats must not move to co common ground, we must move to higher ground. As a result of these vigorous oversight efforts, the, the Dole Shalala Commission was created to assess longstanding health care and disability evaluation issues within DOD and VA. A joint DOD-VA senior oversight committee was also established to implement many of the recommendations made by Dole Shalala Commission. One of those recommendations to improve the military's complicated and time-consuming disability evaluation system is in the process of being fully implemented nationwide. I have one word for all of those at the witness table. We must move with all deliberate speed. Our veterans and our, and our service people cannot wait. I am encouraged that the new integrated disability evaluation system has simplified the process for our wounded warriors and reduced the time it takes for veterans to get their full benefits. And I am proud uh, to say that when the IDES process is fully implemented, it will effectively eliminate the benefit gap faced by our newly minted veterans. But the process is still too time consuming. We can do better. Our service members should not have to wait over a year to determine whether they are fit to continue their military service and, and, and the level of benefits they will receive if they are discharged. 
even if DOD and VA were meeting their goal of completing the IDES process in 295 days, nearly 10 months is simply too long for our service members to wait while their future hangs in the balance. And by the way, their families uh, are also affected greatly. DOD and VA must also do more to improve the exchange of medical records. Given the complicated health conditions facing many of our service members when they leave Iraq or Afghanistan, it is vitally important, therefore, that the health care providers in these two departments communicate seamlessly. And as I close, I know that DOD and VA are in the process of creating the interagency electronic medical record, and I look forward to hearing more about the progress today. And with that, again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Now I recognize the chairman of the full committee, uh, uh, Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's, uh, it's a distinct honor to go after the ranking member so that I can say I agree with everything the ranking member said. This is a, an issue that goes beyond partisanship. This is an issue in which the committee is completely united. I am uh, honored to have Camp Pendleton in my district and the Wounded Warrior facility that is there. And I, there's no there's no distance between uh, Mr. Cummings and myself. I sometimes do see that uh, there are reasons that we have ten months or more in which a Marine continues to try to or a corpsman to return to active full active duty and, and is working through that. But with with the exception of those times in which you're clearly trying to help a soldier, sailor, or Marine or airman remain on active duty, and that extends the determination. I do believe that the process is too slow and continues to be, we can do better, but we haven't yet done it. So again, I, uh, I thank the Chairman for holding this hearing, and I thank Mr. Cummings for his uh, appropriate remarks and yield back. The gentleman yields back. That members will have seven days to submit further opening statements for the record. We will now recognize uh, our panel. Ms. Lynn Simpson is the Acting Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. Mr. John Medvey, did I hope I pronounced that properly, is the Executive Director of the VA DOD Collaboration Service. Mr. Dan Bertoni is the Education Workforce and Income Security Team Director at the GAO. And Mr. Randall Williamson is the Health Care Team Director at the GAO. And Mr. Mark Bird is the IT Team Assistant Director at the Government Accountability Office. We appreciate you all being here today. My understanding is that the GAO is going to submit one opening statement, but they will all participate in the discussion that we have uh, uh, moving forward. It is the uh, pursuant to committee rules. All witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Do you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, in order to allow time for discussion, please try to limit your, your verbal testimony to five minutes. If there are additional materials or statements that you want to put into the record, you, your entire written statement will be uh, made, of, made part of the record. I, again, want to thank you for your time, effort, your expertise, your commitment to our country. I know your hearts are all in the right places. This is a frustrating issue for the time that it has taken, but we do want to hear from each of you. So um, with that, we will now recognize Ms. Simpson for five minutes. Turn them on and pull them, yes. pull them pretty close uh, in order to get the audio to work just right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Chavis, Representative Tierney, um, members of the subcommittee, thank you very much and good morning. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to testify today on our Warriors in Transition with my colleague from the VA, John Medvey. Taking care of our wounded, ill, and injured service members is one of the absolute highest priorities of the Department of Defense the service secretaries and the military service chiefs. The Secretary of Defense has said that, other than directly supporting operations in theater, there is no higher priority for the Department of Defense. Reforming cumbersome and many times confusing bureaucratic processes is absolutely essential to ensuring our service members receive, in a timely manner, the care and benefits to which they are entitled. The Department's leaders continue to work to achieve the highest level of care and management 
and to standardize care among the military services and Federal agencies, while maintaining a laser focus on the wide range of needs of our wounded, ill, and injured service members and their families. Working closely, carefully, and collaboratively between our departments is also of the utmost priority. We have established governance at the highest levels of our respective departments on the wounded, ill, and injured issues. The Secretaries of the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs have met three times in the last 90 days with an increased attention on the disability evaluation system and electronic health records, and have committed also to meet quarterly to continue the dialogue to resolve these critical areas of collaboration between our departments. The Secretary of Defense had directed the establishment of the Department of Defense, Department of Veteran Affairs, Senior Oversight Committee, referred to as the SOC, on May 3, 2007. It was established to ensure the recommendations from the groups that many of you referenced um, were integrated, implemented, and resourced. The Senior Oversight Committee's purpose is to ensure interagency oversight to streamline, deconflict, and expedite efforts to improve the health care process, disability processing, and the seamless transition of service member to veteran status. The deputy secretaries of both departments chair, serve as co-chairs. The overarching purpose of the Senior Oversight Committee is to establish a world-class, seamless continuum of care that is efficient and effective. The SOC has had a lengthy record of accomplishment over its four years of existence in direct support of and caring for our wounded, ill, and injured. I want to offer a few of the accomplishment highlights. Reducing the gap in time service members receive veterans benefits after separation, developing new approaches to address psychological health to include traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, expanding the implementation of the integrated disability evaluation system, providing transitioning service members health records to the VA prior to their separation from military service, and implementing the Recovery Care Coordination Program, highlighting the need to address caregiver issues to ensure that they receive support and information. The disability evaluation system was relatively unchanged from 1949 until 2007. As a result of secretary-level attention, public concern, and congressional interest, the Senior Oversight Committee chartered the DES pilot in November 2007. The SOC vision for this pilot was to create a service member-centric, seamless, and transparent DES administered jointly by the DOD and VA. The pilot transitioned to the integrated disability evaluation system that integrates DOD and VA DES processes so that the service member receives a single set of physical disability evaluations and disability ratings conducted and prepared by the Veterans Affairs Office, with simultaneously processing by both departments to ensure the earliest possible delivery of disability benefits. Both departments use the VA protocols for disability examination and the VA disability rating to make their respective determinations. The Department of Defense is partnering closely with the Department of Veterans Affairs as we aggressively move toward the full implementation of the IDES across all 139 continental United States and outside the continental United States by the end of this fiscal year. The IDES constitutes a major improvement over the legacy system, and both DOD and VA are fully committed to the worldwide expansion of this program. The Department is, however, continuously exploring new ways to improve the current system, because as long as one service member is in the system longer than perceived helpful, we are obligated and committed to do all we can to enhance the experience and make improvements. To that end, the Secretaries of Defense and Veterans Affairs have asked the teams to explore other options which could shorten the overall length of the disability evaluation process from its current goal of 295 days. In addition, the departments are also looking closely at the stages of the disability evaluation system that are outside the timeliness tolerances and developing options to bring these stages within the goal. We are committed to do all we can within our areas of influence to enhance the experience and process, and will ensure to keep the Congress informed of this progress along the way and as new initiatives are identified that can further advance the efficiency and effectiveness of the disability evaluation process. 
Another highlight from the Senior Oversight Committee was that drove to significant enhancement involves the Ms. attention Ms. to caregivers. Perhaps if we could submit the, the balance of that testimony and, and so that we have time to get through the full panel. Sure, I would be happy questions. to do that. I will I'll, we'll jump to the end of the, my last paragraph that summarizes what I have been trying to say to you this morning. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members, I cannot overstate how far DOD has come with our VA partners in the past four years since the SOC and other governance processes were put in place. Our support for our wounded, ill, and injured is night and day from the events that occurred at Walter Reed in 2007. Each of the services has stood up a very comprehensive and standalone warrior care program, as many of you are aware and have visited here and in your districts. Yet we still have much progress to make. And as I close, I would like to be articulate again that one mistake, mistreatment, undue delay, or any other aberration in the care or transition of our wounded, ill, or injured service members is one too many. We will continue to work with our teammates at VA and throughout the interagency to do anything and everything we can to provide our service members with the absolute best care and treatment that they so rightfully deserve in return for their selfless service and sacrifice to our nation. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Medvey will now recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the subcommittee, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is John Medvey, Executive Director of the Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Defense Collaboration Service for VA's Office of Policy and Planning. I am pleased to be joined by the Chief of Staff from the Under Secretary of Defense Office of Personnel and Readiness, Lynn Simpson. I would like to provide the subcommittee with an overview of collaboration between the VA and DOD to ensure a seamless transition of our wounded, ill, and injured service members from active duty to veteran status. I ask that my complete statement be included in the record. Much has been accomplished in the wake of the problems identified at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 2007 to improve the DOD disability process and the resulting transition to veteran status. The focus of my testimony is VA and DOD's joint efforts to make the improvements and to integrate and create an integrated disability process for service members who are being medically separated. Currently, we are in the process of implementing the integrated disability evaluation system, the process used to transition the wounded, ill, and injured who are unfit for continued service from service member to veteran. In early 2007, VA partnered with DOD to make changes in D to the DOD's existing DES. A modified process called VA DOD Desk Pilot was launched in November 2007. The Desk Pilot was intended to simplify the disability process, increase the transparency, reduce the processing time, and improve the consistency of the disability ratings among the services and between the services and VA. Authorization for the pilot was included in the National Defense Authorization Act of 2008 and further energized our efforts for improving DOD's DES process. The DES pilot model was launched originally at three operational sites in the National Capital Region and recognized a significant improvement over the legacy process. The pilot model was subsequently expanded in 2008 and 2009, ultimately covering 27 sites and 47 percent of the DES population when ended in March 2010. In July 2010, the co-chairs of the Senior Oversight Committee agreed to expand the pilot and rename it IDES. Senior leadership of VA, the services, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff strongly supported this plan and the need to expand the benefits of this improved as pilot model to all service members. VA and DOD are now working together to launch IDES enterprise-wide. As a result, in October 2010, we started the transition from the existing legacy process to IDES using the pilot model process. Currently, there are 77 IDES sites operational na nationwide, which includes the original 27, covering 72 percent of the DES population, and when fully implemented in October 2011, there will be a total of 139 sites. Through the implementation of IDES, the departments hope to create a more transparent, consistent, and expeditious disability evaluation process. We believe that through the implementation of the DES pilot, we have largely achieved that goal. 
To explain, in contrast to the DES legacy process, the pilot model provides a single disability examination and a single source disability rating that are used by both departments in executing their respective responsibility. This results in more consistent evaluations, faster decisions, and timely benefit delivery for those medically retired or separated. As a result, VA benefits can be delivered in the shortest period allowed by law following discharge, thus eliminating the pay gap that previously existed under the legacy process. The DOD VA integrated approach has also eliminated much of the sequential and duplicative processes found in the legacy system. Overall processing time for the delivery of DOD disability benefits was reduced from an average of 540 days to a goal of 295 days, while simultaneously shortening the period until the delivery of VA disability benefits after separation from an average of 166 days to approximately 30 days. There were challenges and lessons learned. VA and DOD recognized that we expanded outside the NCR. We did not have robust business processes in place to certify each site's preparedness before it became operation, operational. Through analysis of lessons learned by working with Congress, we have developed uh, initial operating cap capability readiness criteria that stress quality over expedience to ensure that future sites are operationally ready for IDES. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I will cut short the rest of my statement in the interest of time and thank you again for your support of our wounded, ill, and injured service members, veterans, and their families, an opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is my understanding that, in, uh, that Mr. Bertoni is going to make the opening statement in, for the GAO. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the subcommittee, good morning. I am pleased to discuss the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs efforts to integrate their disability evaluation systems. I am joined today by Randy Williamson of our health care team, who can address any questions you may have regarding VA's Federal Recovery Coordination Program and Mark Byrd of our information technology team who can field any questions on systems integration and data sharing between the departments. Mr. Chairman, thousands of service members have been wounded or injured in Iraq and Afghanistan, and many who can't continue their military service must navigate complex disability evaluation systems in both DOD and VA. GAO and others have identified problems with these systems, including delayed decisions, duplicative processes, and confusion among service members. 2007, DOD and VA piloted an Integrated Disability Evaluation System, or IDES, to streamline, to streamline and expedite the delivery of VA benefits to service members. My statement today summarizes and updates key findings of our December 2010 report, which examined the agency's evaluation of the pilot results, key implementation challenges, and efforts to mitigate those challenges in advance of a pl planned worldwide rollout. In summary, in their evaluation, the departments noted that the pilot had improved service member satisfaction relative to the legacy system and met their goals for delivering VA benefits to active duty and reserve members within 295 and 305 days, respectively. Despite meeting the overall timeliness goal, not all service branches achieved the same results. Only the Army, with about 60 percent of all cases, met the established goals, while average processing times for the other services were substantially higher. Moreover, as caseloads have increased, processing times have also steadily worsened. And as of March 2010, active duty cases took an average of 394 days to complete. The Departments have also had difficulty meeting their goal for the percentage of cases processed on time and have since adjusted that goal downward from 80 percent to 50 percent. And over the past six months, the data shows that this new, lower goal has never been met for active duty cases and only rarely for Reserve and National Guard cases. DOD and VA encountered several implementation challenges with the pilot that contributed to delays. Nearly all the sites we visited experienced staffing shortages to some degree, often due to workloads exceeding original projections. Shortages and delays were most severe at sites that had large caseload surges related to deployments. And at one location, it took over 140 days to complete the single medical exam well in excess of the 45-day goal. We identified other issues and delays associated with the single exam, such as problems with completeness and clarity of exam summaries and disagreements between DOD and VA medical staff on some diagnoses. Pilot sites also experienced logistical challenges, such as incorporating VA staff into military facilities and housing service members awaiting a decision. 
As DOD and VA proceed with rapid expansion worldwide, they are taking steps to address several challenges. This includes increasing exam and case management personnel via additional hiring, staff reallocations, and contracting, requiring more thorough assessments of site readiness and contingency plans for addressing caseload surges, and making changes to improve the quality of exam summaries. While these initiatives are promising, we have recommended that DOD and VA take steps to ensure sites have enough military physicians to handle projected workloads, as well as available housing and operational capacity to absorb service members. It is also critical that the departments proactively assess and mitigate delays associated with diagnostic differences and insufficient exam summaries, and going forward, develop a robust data collection monitoring mechanism to identify and address local level challenges, such as sudden staffing shortages. In conclusion, the IDES shows promise for expediting the delivery of VA benefits to service members. However, we have identified significant challenge, challenges that require our careful attention. While the steps taken to date may mitigate these challenges, the current deployment schedule remains ambitious in light of substantial unresolved issues and evidence of steadily worsening processing times. Thus, it is unclear whether actions taken will sufficiently timely support worldwide implementation. Timeframes aside, the ultimate success or failure of IDES will depend on DOD and VA's ability to quickly and effectively address resource needs, make adjustments, and resolve challenges as they arise, not only at initiation, but on an ongoing basis. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I am happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I am going to recognize myself for five minutes. And, um, Ms. Simpson, Mr. Medvey, I, I, I appreciate the, the task that you have before you. When I hear, see, and read what the GAO has to say, and I listen to your statements and presentations, you seem like you are on different planets. Uh, and and that is that's the concern. Let me, let me ask specifically, because I hope at the conclusion of this we have at least some sense of the timing, the realistic timing, the cost that this, I, I haven't heard much mention of what this is all costing, and some explanation of why it is taking so long. Because we talk about we, May 3, 2007, <laughs> virtually about four years, almost to the date, and yet we feel like we are still sliding backwards as opposed to, to forwards. Can veterans da now download their electronic medical records with the click of a mouse? Yes or no? Ms. Simpson. Yes, they can, both with the VA and from our TRICARE health, health Agency. Mr. Medvey, can they do that? They can do it through the blue button system, Mr. Chairman. So it, it, Not, they, can, they can download information from the medical records in the blue button. Can we get the assessment from the GAO? Is that something that they can do? Click on the mouse and download their records? Uh, yes, they, they can, but the information that is available to them may be limited. It, explain that to me. Well, there are not all medical records are necessarily in electronic form. So my understanding is that the, the, what's in electronic form is what they self-import, right? That what they per, what they themselves put into the system, or is it broader than that? No, it's broader. But it's not. Is it complete? It may it may not be complete. How do they figure out if it's complete or not? I mean, that is one of the issues, right? When the, the President made this quote during the State of the Union, quote, veterans can now download their electronic medical records with the click of a mouse, end quote. But then right after that, we had the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of American President uh, comment that that was not true. And he said, quote, the President's comments are misleading to service members, veterans, and the American public who now think that this system is in place and functional while it is clearly not. Is, is he right or is he not right? Mr. Byrd. As I said, there is information that is readily available at the click of a, of a button, but the information for all veterans in all cases may not be complete. Do you have any sense of how, A, how do we get to that finish line? I not, but how much of it is in there? How much, what percentage of this is actually done? And how do we get to that finish line? I mean, it is a huge mammoth task, no, no doubt about it. Yes. And the, the departments, frankly, have been working on this, uh, on this, the exchange, the electronic exchange of health records 
for over 10 years. Uh, they have slowly been increasing the extent to which they can exchange records starting back in 1998 to the present time. Um, there are in some cases limitations in the systems within the departments uh, that, that preclude the full exchange of, uh, of medical records for any individual. How close are they to completing this? Is this next month? Is it next year? I, how, if there is a spectrum and we are trying to get to the finish line, and it recognize it is an ongoing process, but information technology is supposed to make life simpler, easier, swifter, more effective, more efficient, not more burdensome. How, where are we on that spectrum? Well, it is difficult to say because I, the, the extent of the problem hasn't necessarily been defined yet uh, by the departments. And the, um, the, the, the desired end state is frequently moving as technology improves and as certain capabilities are delivered, people want more. Do anybody else from the GAO care to, to comment on that? I, I could talk more on a, from a logistics and operational standpoint with the IDES. Uh, the larger macro issue of, of data sharing between DOD and VA affects not only, well, primarily uh, folks who have left the services and are in, in, in the, the world and need to get their records, and it is very difficult. In terms of the IDES, uh, that is pretty much a self-contained unit. You have got VA staff, you have got DOD staff in these medical treatment facilities, and the, the problem they have is their individual systems haven't been integrated sufficiently on site. So we have workarounds, we have manual processes, we have multiple uh, computers on, on individuals' desks to sort of access multiple sites. But in the case of this project, I think, would it expedite if they had a, a seamless, seamless access to each other's records? Yes. Would it facilitate quicker processing? Absolutely. Is it the Achilles heel for this system? No. I think there are bigger issues. What, and what are those bigger issues? Initially, I think uh, not staffing the, the sites appropriately, not maintaining the ratios of staff to, uh, to workloads to cases, um, just not having the appropriate knowledge, skills, and ability on the ground when these sites were stood up, primary. All right. There is lots more to discuss, but I am coming to the conclusion of my time in respect to the five minutes. I uh, will now recognize uh, Mr. Welch from uh, Vermont for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you calling this hearing. Uh, Mr. Williamson, I want to thank you uh, for uh, conducting that G GAO study, uh, which uh, I and others had requested uh, after that Washington Post uh, a series of articles. Can you outline, I missed your opening statement, so I apologize. You don't have to recover uh, answers that you have already given, but can you please uh, share how the findings of that study uh, can help this committee on how we can move forward in making the transition uh, from DOD to the VA more streamlined uh, for our soldiers. The study we, we completed uh, on March 23rd was on the Federal Recovery Coordination Program. And uh, as you may know, that is a program for the most severely catastrophically injured, ill, and, and wounded uh, service members. Um, we, uh, in the process of that, we've, we've obviously looked at a, a variety of other programs. As you, as you know, each of the services has their own Wounded Warrior Program. Uh, and in addition to the FR, you know, the, the Federal Recovery Coordination Program, there, that, which is administered by VA, there is a uh, Recovery Coordination Program administered by DOD as well. And so there are a lot of organizations that uh, are involved in, in terms of care coordination and case management. Um, some of the, the IT issues in terms of coordination, uh, just to kind of follow on what, what uh, the chairman was talking about, uh, there are, you know, it is very important uh, because of the overlap that occurs between all the programs, the wounded water programs that are now ongoing, it is very important that these, these uh, programs coordinate with one another. And right now, um, the Recovery Coordination Program has a, you know, a, a comprehensive transition plan, uh, as we, and, and the FRP also has that. So it is important that if they are not talking to one another or can't communicate with one another, they, uh, they have problems. We had a situation where you know, I am not going to have a lot of time. Okay. So what I think would be helpful is what are on the base of your study, what are the one, two, three 
okay. types of recommendations that you okay. might the, have. The recommendations deal with uh, proper uh, identification of potential enrollees. Um, right now, they need to do a better job of, of identifying uh, the people who are severely wounded, and that is an issue because there is no good database of severely wounded people. Uh, number two, uh, determining the number of staff and the, and the workload ratio okay. so that we don't overload, and, and three, where to place the people. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Ms. Simpson and Mr. Medvey a question. When the, when the Vermont Guard uh, returned, and we had our largest Guard deployment since the Second World War, uh, over 200 were kept on medical hold uh, with the DOD and not able to return home to their family to begin that reintegration process. And the question is, uh, how can members of the National Guard and Reserve have access to the high quality of care that is provided by the Department of Defense without losing the opportunity uh, to get those, the benefits of receiving that care closer to home? Uh, and that is particularly uh, a challenge for our members of the Guard, uh, who are many of them living in very rural and remote areas. And I will start with you, Ms. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Um, I think the uh, issues that you highlighted for the Guard are of utmost priority to both departments. And um, because of the unique nature of the Guard being um, part of a community, um, it is more difficult to get services to them. However, that being said, the, um, there's been an increased emphasis to um, ensure that they not only have the benefits and care from these uh, transition units, but also making an outreach to the community. The Army in particular has done a good job trying to reach back to the communities on behalf of the Guard and Reserve community. Um, there is more to be done, obviously, because uh, the Guard and Reserve community is one of our highest priorities as they have some of their statistics are not as um, good as some of the others. So we are working on that exactly, exact, exact issue. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Medvey? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, as Ms. Simpson said, uh, we are looking at the specific issues surrounding uh, Guard and Reserve. And uh, you know, when, when they return from a deployment, uh, DOD has them. As we look at somebody that uh, may be unfit, uh, we are working through those specific issues of getting them through the IDS program and looking for ways that we can do this treatment much closer to the home base. Uh, to ensure that we have got the requisite staff that can handle that influx. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Thank you. I uh, will now recognize Vice Chairman Mr. Labrador from Idaho for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Byrd, I just want to follow up on a question that the Chairman asked you. I am not sure I, I understood your answer. Um, in the State of the Union, President Obama stated that veterans can now download their electronic medical records with the click of a mouse, and you said that that is somewhat true. But you were not specific enough uh, letting us know what exactly they can download. I am just going to quote um, the President of the Iraq and Afghanistan's Veterans of America. He says that these comments are mis misleading to service members, veterans, and the American public who now think that this system is in place functional. While it's not clear, it's this, while it's not clear, it, this is clearly not. But then he says specifically that from the VA system, what you can download are pharmaceutical records and personal health information that he or she has self-entered. Is that an accurate statement? I believe that is an accurate statement. So that is all you can download right now, is pharmaceutical records and then self-inputted information? That, that is my understanding. Okay. So, you, so, so what do you think the President meant when he said that veterans can now download all this information. I wouldn't want to speculate. Okay. Anybody else uh, want to take a crack at that? Okay. Ms. Simpson, could you please comment on that? I was just going to say that uh, the, I think the blue button, as Mr. Medvey mentioned, is the um, uh, reference to the trying to get to that goal that you are talking about, the full electronic health record and that has made significant progress. I am not uh, technically uh, detailed in the exact information that the member can get, though. But okay. the blue button, is, is, as Mr. Medvey said, is the technical way to, that they get the information. Okay. So we are trying to achieve 
uh, you know, this compliance where they can actually download, but it, it sounds like we are not really there yet. Now, um, we have a system, the interagency, you know, IDES system, and we also have the legacy DES system. Ms. Simpson, can you tell me what was the projected cost of the legacy DES program? I don't have that figure for the, the cost, but we can get that for you. Okay. I want to know what the projected cost was, and I want to know what the actual cost was. Do, do you, Mr. Medvey, have that information? Uh, sir, uh, DES is, is a DOD, DOD program, so I wouldn't have that information on IDES in terms of our uh, projections for health uh, care with VHA and VA. Those are embedded in their overall budget because, uh, frankly, service members who transition through IDES would be our customers anyway. So we project for that population. Can you provide that information for the record? Sir, I actually have, as of November, I have some numbers. That would be uh, great. Thank DOD you. DOD estimates $63 million annually for the uh, IDES, with VBA's portion about $33 million and VHA at $17. Um, and additional benefits paid out would be $960 million. Okay. And what was the projected cost? That is what the actual cost I do not cost. know the projected, just what, what their estimates were at that right. time. Thank you. Um, According to your testimony, Mr. Medvey, you said that through the implementation of IDES, departments hope to create a more transparent, consistent, expeditious program. Um, and you believe that it will largely achieve the goal of creating a more transparent, consistent program. Um, do, do you believe, why, why do you think that is just largely? Do, do you think that it is going to achieve these goals, or do you think that it is not going to achieve the goals? No, I believe it will achieve the goals, and in many cases we have uh, with service members. Does GAO uh, agree with this assessment, Mr. Bertoni? I think the concept of, of transparency is, is built into it. We have a, a system, uh, unlike the legacy system, where we have case management, clinical and non-clinical case management from referral through payment of VA benefits. So to, to the extent that these folks are able to do their job, they have sufficient workloads and ratios where they can, that they can actually speak with the service member and explain to them why things are happening the way they are, why the decisions are, are playing out the way they are. I think you do have a much more transparent system. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have no more questions. Just one last comment. Uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, we have had this problem for four years trying to figure out how the system works. and. Um, this is a lot of the same stuff that we are going to be doing with the health care system if it goes national. So uh, I have some concerns about the projected costs in the future for a, a health care system. Thank you. The gentleman uh, yields back. Now recognize the ranking member of the, uh, the committee, uh, Mr. Tierney from Massachusetts, for five minutes. I thank the chairman. I thank the chairman for having this hearing as well and, and the uh, folks on the dais for testifying. Uh, Mr. Bertoni uh, or Mr. Williamson, Mr. Burr, let me, let me ask you folks one thing. It, uh, is it your impression that the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense uh, completed all the recommendations that you made with respect to their pilot program? We have uh, made recommendations dating back to 2007. To the extent that we have asked them to institute more robust um, assessment practices while they were uh, going through the pilot, we think they have been fairly responsive. We did just, I, I would say, responsive. Um, I think the design of the pilot was better. The metrics they were capturing uh, were better because they were responsive to our recommendations. Um, down the road, we just issued a report in December where we have several recommendations in which they have agreed. And uh, to the extent that uh, they complete them, I think they will have a positive impact. Okay. Do you have an estimate of how long it should, it should take them to complete the there, recommendations in December? There are some estimates. We had asked them to, do an, uh, to look at the extent to which there are disagreements in diagnoses between DOD and VA, which we believe could be substantial. Um, I have been doing this quite a while, and usually Federal disability programs, uh, cases tend to get mired in the mud when you can't complete the medical record or you have disagreements about the medical record. They sit on desks. They have to be looked at again. Uh, medical exams expire, and we see the service member on the disability evaluation hamster wheel. So we think they really need to get uh, to look at this issue, and I believe they intend to study it and uh, uh, make a determination of whether adjustments need to be made by July 2011. 
and there are other areas where they are actively right now making adjustments. To what extent, if any, do you think that this disagreement, or maybe substantial disagreements on disability, uh, would be a case of hoping that the other department or agency incurs the cost? I don't think that is the issue. I think it is just it's the way that their criteria is laid out in terms of how they assess uh, disability, terminology, nomenclature, nomenclature um, guidance. I, I think there, there, is, there are just fundamental differences across the two entities uh, when, and things get lost in the translation. Right now there is there's, there's guidance being developed. Um, it's, uh, we haven't seen it and uh, we really don't know how it is going to address this problem. But we're, what we are really concerned about is we went to 10 sites. We heard this at enough sites to raise it to the attention of the agencies, that you really need to get your hand around extent and nature and the impact on delays. Uh, that is good M MI information to make some adjustments. Um, Mr. Bedford and Ms. Simpson, is there any talk in the Veterans Administration Department of Defense about kicking this up to the, the White House level a little bit here to get a referee? I mean, somebody has got to be able to make a decision as opposed to let it keep being arbitrated and negotiated back and forth there. At some point, somebody has got to set some leadership, some direction, make a decision and force movement. Mr. Ranking Member, I mean, as uh, Mr. Bertoni said, one of the recommendations was for us for us to, uh, to look at those discrepancies. As he said, we are uh, undergoing a study right now which will be uh, coming out in July. We are also looking at a number of variety of ways because, as, as he points out, when most of the cases that there is a discrepancy, it revolves around sort of the mental health issues. And those are tough calls to make in terms of service members. And so while the DOD doctors will have had a service member for a while and, and have an opinion, and then when we do the exam, we may come to a different conclusion. So we are working out a way that we can leverage the ongoing treatment uh, get that in a form where our raters can look at that and then use that as the basis for making the determination which should uh, uh, help eliminate any discrepancies. Had nobody identified that issue between the time that you were working on the pilot and the time you decided to start trying to scale this program up? I mean, it sounds to me like there was no plan on how the scaling up was going to happen. Uh, Mr. Ray, I, I can't answer that, that question. I, I wasn't there during the, the pilot phase of it. Uh, I, I know, you know a number of these issues, you are dealing with individual cases. And so as you are dealing with you know, individual services. Yeah, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, not, yeah, I know we are dealing with individual cases, and I am aware of all the difficulties that presents. But when we had a pilot program, presumably we identified some of the issues there. And before we went to moving into scaling it up, I would have thought there would have been a plan. The plan would have entailed resolving some of these issues. Mr. Bartoni, are you aware of any plan where they, they said these are the issues, we are going to get these resolved, and this is how we are going to deal with it as we scale it up? C certainly the pilot <coughs> identified challenges that the DOD and VA um, have uh, uh, undertaken efforts to address. I think one of the issues was at the time they issued their report in August of 2010 that there were only 1,300 completed cases, and they were working off of, of uh, data that was six months old at the time that they began analyzing it. So I think some of the emerging issues just hadn't worked their way through the system yet. By the time we started to look uh, a year later at some of the data, some of these trends were starting to play themselves out more fully. So uh, making decisions on the basis of 1,300 cases on the goodness of the pilot, that's, they, were, they, they were able to do that in some respects, but I don't think they knew everything that was going to be coming down the road. Thank you. Thank you. We will now recognize Mr. Gosar of Arizona for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Williamson, let me make sure I got this right. Uh, you made the comment just a minute ago because of a lack of documentation of the injured. Are we kidding me? Is that true? Uh, yeah, well, again, the, the Federal Recovery Coordination Program covers the severely injured, and there is no database in DOD or VA that actually defines what severely wounded is or keeps track of it. So it makes it difficult for the program to identify potential enrollees. Well, this, this seems just backwards to me. I am a dentist, and, and health records are everything to a patient for continuity of care. And, and I see this over and over in my district. We collect claims from White Mountains to the Native Americans to Flagstaff to Prescott to Phoenix, all about this. And this is the simplest of tasks. Um, and it comes back to you know the lack of an interagency discipline mm -hmm. to have something that both um, uh, agencies can agree upon. Um, would you not agree on that, Mrs. Simpson, Ms. Madden? 
I think absolutely it, it requires both departments working together at, th throughout the entire department at the senior levels of leadership and to address those specific issues. And I believe that the teams are working to address those. Uh, wasn't there a uh, meeting of, on May 2nd? And what was the follow-up on that? Can you give us some details? I was not present at the meeting. Um, the, we're in the process of documenting the next steps and um, for both the issues of the electronic health record and the disability evaluation system and the way forward. And both departments will be connecting on that to get specific and <laughs> addressing those issues. I, I find a real disconnect. I, I, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, these are people's lives, and, and having gone over to Walter Reed to see the severely injured, to see even some of the folks that are, are looking at uh, problems with um, uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, syndrome type aspects, folks, it's, it's, it's that easy. And it seems like we are just studying this over and over and over again, going nowhere. And I mean, it is a common theme throughout our whole, uh, my whole district which is laden with veterans and, and our military uh, supporters. And this is unacceptable, just absolutely unacceptable, because the whole system is now in place and it, as a problem. <laughs> it is interfering with the treatment of our, of our soldiers. Would you not agree? Access to data and information absolutely is critical to being able to address issues. I agree. And why aren't we prioritizing that record? I mean, it, this, is, this is no different. I am not going to give you any solace, because in the private sector, we are not given that leeway. And I don't see we should be giving you any more leeway because of what is what's impounding here. And, and not to have documentation upon uh, severely wounded people that are coming back here, that is the minimum standard, folks. That is a minimum standard. What you are giving us is unacceptable results absolutely unacceptable results. How, I, not knowing what, what came about on, a, on May 2nd, what is your, Ms. Simpson, where, where would you go with this? I mean, you are in a position of, of making a comment and, and, and putting your weight behind an idea. Where would you like to see this go? I believe we would like to see go exactly what you are talking about, um, commitment and service to getting um, our service members and our wounded warriors and into veteran status seamlessly has got to be the utmost priority. And the um, technical aspects of the systems, I am not detailed in that type of uh, information, but there are very um, dedicated people on both departments that are working tirelessly to make sure that the technical, systematic architecture and the details about the infrastructure that is required to support the record you are referring to is, is going to be a reality. I would hope somebody in leadership would actually stand up and be counted, because too many times our, 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 our men and women who have who put their lives on the line are, are being the victims here, and that is inappropriate. You know, um, you know we have heard this over and over again throughout my district, like I said. And I would like to see in a few short weeks, we are going to celebrate Memorial Day. And I hope especially that it is very important during this time that we remember our obligations. And, and it is not about saving our job. It is not about not speaking up. It is about speaking up on behalf of what is right. And I don't see a lot of that happening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The, the gentleman yields back. We will now recognize Mr. Quigley from uh, Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Simpson, um, I will ask you, but if anyone else wants to chime in, I would appreciate it. Uh, isn't it true that the, the problems at Fort Carson is really a staffing problem? And are you concerned that this is uh, not just Fort Carson, but these systemic shortages could lead to these same delays across the entire system? I think an element of the issues at Fort Carson was the staffing issues, and one of the um, actual lessons learned from the disability from the pilot, the first pilot, was in fact having accountability and a thorough assessment of making sure that all aspects of the requirements to integrate the systems was in place before going live. So the, the teams now are going around to the different sites and looking at best practices. Not every site has the severity of issues as identified in Fort Carson, um, but 
to address that, we are looking at the other sites to incorporate the lessons learned there and getting more specific in the metrics that are consistent across all the sites. Well, then how much of it is the staffing issue there and what is the danger of it spreading? I mean, how do you break it down? Is it the analysis you are doing now to try to answer that question? If you don't mind, Congressman, uh, one of the things that we learned in terms of uh, as we move forward with IDS is we had not instituted a process that brought together the teams before they stood up uh, in their respective sites uh, and applied a rigorous methodology of, of making sure they understood what they were getting into as they were going to implement. We started that back in September uh, with the first iteration where we brought them all together. We sat them as groups. We had them do a uh, site assessment. Uh, and then from that site assessment, it went through a murder board where people looked at their analysis. And after that analysis, uh, they developed their uh, draft implementation plan. So they got a good sense of where they were from a requirements uh, standpoint in terms of what they needed for staffing, and then uh, developed their plan. And it had to be certified by uh, two senior executives, one from DOD, one from VA, for each local site. And uh, that, that, again, I think is, is building on the recommendations that the GAO made. Uh, as part of that, they also had to develop contingency plans should there be an influx of how they would handle uh, additional cases coming into the system. So I think what happened at Fort Carson, we did learn that lesson. We have embedded it inst and institutionalized it in our going forward plan for uh, rolling it out uh, for the rest of the, the fiscal year. I can't help, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my frustration here is I am flashing back to my <laughs> ac academic days in public policy. I feel like I am getting an answer that would be suitable for a public administration class. Uh, in, in layman's terms, the essence of the problem, how much of it is staffing, how much of it is we just screwed up and didn't know how to do this the right way? So I think, I think at the beginning we didn't have as good a plan as we needed. We, under, we uh, did not apply the leadership from the local level up, uh, and we have now turned that around to where the Chief of Staff of the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army have quarterly uh, VTCs with the Army IDES sites to hold each site and both department personnel accountable for that. Uh, we are examining the uh, staffing on a, as part of that process, and if there is a requirement to add more staff, we are doing it. I, I respect how difficult this is. I, I really do. I guess I don't understand how it, it can crop up. It, it sounds like the first day on the job, doing this for a long time. What changed to make it all of a sudden a problem that you had to uncover? So I could, I could take a crack at that from a GAO standpoint. I think, uh, as Mr. Medby stated, the upfront work in terms of doing a look back on the history of Carson would have been very helpful, a more granular look at a month-by-month -month look at what the deployment schedules look like, what did the impairments look like, um, numbers, types of, of impairments, illnesses, injuries. Then you can build your knowledge, skills, and abilities around that. In the case of Carson, there were a very short, there was a large shortage in specialty medical exams. Many of these folks are coming back from multiple in, in deployments. The science says when you go through multiple deployments, more likely to have PTSD and other uh, mental impairments to deal with. So if you know the history of the site, you can build your staffing model around that and be ready for surges. And, and if that was not done, we think it is being done better now. And what, it, possible to continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then it gets to the question is, if this is new, is it because we are in uncharted territory about how many deployments we are sending our, our young men and women to? Anybody? The deployments piece is not new. I think the uh, new the, the deployment what? The deployment assessments is not new. Um, but then what is new is how many deployments we are asking our, our people to go on, to go through. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what 
what we are trying to say, or at least Mr. Medney and I are trying to say, is that the issues that were not addressed in the first um, look at the pilot were um, categorized into a plan, and now they have constant interaction and talking with one another through these various forums that Mr. Medby mentioned, and the constant attention to making sure that all of the staffing, the facilities, all of the things that are required to make sure that the site is able to function at the utmost quality is there. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank our participants, but with the greatest respect, I am not any smarter. Maybe that is an attack on me after this discussion that I was coming in and reading this and being prepared. But uh, I do appreciate what you have done to put this together. Thank you. gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthal, for five minutes. Thank you very much. I, I never cease to be amazed at the inability of the Federal Government to create what seems to me to be a relatively simple computer system that works. Uh, I, I'm stunned by it. So I want to take a step back and just kind of look at what's actually involved in doing this. We had a comment, I think it was Mr. Medvey, that we had some staffing issues. Are the staffing issues doctors or the staffing issues data input clerks? Where is the staffing problem? That is my first question. In terms of IDS, we, what we needed to understand was what the requirement was at each site based on their specific uh, requirements. So it was a combination of ensuring that we had the amount of uh, medical professionals who could do the examinations, that we had the requisite number of uh, VA military service coordinators to handle the cases, and then correspondingly the DOD had the number of, of physical evaluation board liaison officers. Okay. That. Well, here is my concern on this. I actually have a little bit of experience in this. When I had a computer company before I came to Congress, and we were uh, approached by a, a chain of five minor emergency centers that wanted to do an electronic medical record system uh, online and web-based. We did that with five people in four months. Now, I realize you all have a whole lot bigger scale, but it doesn't seem like it is a whole lot different project with maybe the addition of some workflows. You have got a doctor in the military that sees them. They dictate the report or they enter it into the computer themselves. Then they move on, get discharged. They move on to the Veterans Administration. They get evaluated by another doctor who dictates or enters that report. It gets reviewed by somebody that says uh, yes or no, and the checks start coming. I realize that is a gross oversimplification, but that is a pretty simple, it seems to me that is a pretty simple database application with some workflow. It, I would bet if you put it just in simple terms and gave it to a student at Harvard, he could probably get it done in the evening. We got Facebook up in three or four, you know, in no time with a kid in his spare time. Uh, I mean, am I missing something here? Could, could anybody tell me how it is that much more complicated than that? In the case of the IDES, what we found was uh, it was a people issue. You, at each stage of the process, there is a workload. Let's just talk about ratings. Um, to the extent that there aren't enough raters in play, that workload is going to back up. Medical exams, to the extent that there aren't enough medical examiners to uh, handle the workload. And if we get a surge from a deployment on top of that, that work is going to back up. Yes, right. computers and, and automation can help leverage limited resources, um, but, I, but it has to be hand in hand with appropriate workload ratios. I understand that, but it, it seems like we, these are the men and women that have put their lives on the line for our country. There is no way they are going to get discharged from the military before they see a doctor. That doctor ought to be able to make an initial assessment, and you all ought to trust your brother agency that that is a good initial uh, assessment so they can get the money that they deserve to take care of their family as soon as they get out, and then you all can take as long as you want to do the second evaluation and, and, and say no. We have created too many steps and too much red tape to get that done. Could you guys, would, would you guys just do me a favor, as are, when you all finish, just stand out in the hall and, and work out the ten steps that it takes to get this done and see how we can implement it. And forget the red tape, forget the standard, just do a block diagram on the back of a napkin and then hand it to some kid at Harvard and let him write it. It, it is simple, basic, undergrad computer science to get the technology to work, and I think you need to give your, uh, your brother and sister agencies the benefit of the doubt. So 
I, I apologize for preaching more than I ask questions, but I'm just appalled at the amount of time and the disservice we are doing to the men and women uh, who have uh, sacrificed life and limb for this country. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I will now recognize the, the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Cummings, Maryland, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, go back to what I said in my opening statement. Um, <coughs> Mr. Attorney, I uh, complimented you for back in 2007 uh, grabbing a hold of this issue, and I was telling them about how we were at Walter Reed and what we saw back then. And we have some, seen some improvement. But one of the things I am most concerned about is that I think that we may be um, accepting a normal that is simply inappropriate. Um, and I don't know that we are dealing with what the President talks about on other issues, and that is the urgency of now. Um, According to DOD and VA, under the original pilot program, the departments were able to meet their goals of reducing the average disability evaluation processing time for an active duty military below 295 days and reducing the average processing time for service reservists to under 305 days. However, according to GAO, the average uh, case processing time has steadily increased. Let me say that this is simply unacceptable. I am uh, very concerned about the rapid increase in the average processing time to complete the IDS system. They are now well above the initial goals of 295 and 305 days. It appears as if DOD and VA are unable to replicate the success of the pilot program as the IDS program has expanded to additional sites. Mr. Medvey, can you explain why uh, this is the case? Congressman, I, we have noticed an increase. That is why, as Secretary Shinseki looks at this, he, he feels very strongly that this is a leadership issue from the lowest level up to the top. And that is why we have instituted uh, uh, reviews at, at all levels to understand what each site is facing in terms of challenges what resources they might need, how we can get those resources to them, if, if there are people that, that uh, uh, need to be added or uh, if there is equipment that needs to be sent there. Uh, as I stated before, we have uh, now instituted very senior le leader uh, sessions between the VA and uh, the Army to examine each one of these sites in detail. And so when, do we, when, do we, when can we expect an answer? with regard to the results of what you are talking about. You know, we, 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 we went out to Walter Reed, and I cannot get this man off of my mind. We went and we saw a gentleman, and I feel emotional just talking about it, We had both of his legs blown off, and one of them was, it was cut so high up to about the waist, they basically had nothing to strap it onto. And when I see people like that and we, we talk about how much we love our veterans, how much we love our service members, we applaud what was just done by our Navy SEALs and those brave men and women who did uh, uh, resolve the issue the last few days. And then it seems like, you know, suddenly we are talking about we are going to meet, we are going to meet, we are going to meet. At some point, somebody has got to say, wait a minute, these people are suffering now. Not yesterday, now. They have done their job. And so this constant thing of let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, that is fine. But when I see numbers increasing, that is a problem. I mean, it seems like alarm bells should go off everywhere. And I, th I think that is why Mr. Chaffetz, Mr. Tierney um, are so concerned, and all of us are concerned about these issues. And I am I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if we are all getting it. And so to constantly say this, you know, we're looking at it at the highest levels. This is the question. <clears throat> can you tell us when the chairman can bring you back before us with some answers to the questions that you just raised? You know, why is this happening? How it's happening? How do we deal with it? 
so that we can, can get on with it because I think, you know what I fear? I fear in six months we'll be saying the same stuff and more people will have suffered. So can you give us a date by which, and Mr. Chairman, I, I just, it's just something that I think we need to do, that have you all come back and give us some real answers and show us some progress? Can you, can you do that for us? Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I can give you an exact date. I know that we're, as we move out to... Six months. How about six months? How about three? Mr. Chairman, we will come back uh, any time we are invited to... Uh... No, no, you are not listening to me. What I am asking you to do is give us... I'm, I'm, I, want, I don't want us to have a hearing and then we come back and hear the same stuff. So if you tell me three months, <clears throat> I would suggest the Chairman, and he will do what he, he chooses. I understand that, Mr. Chairman. I will give you three and a half if you say three. If you say two, I will say two and a half. But we got to have answers. And we've got to act on this with the urgency of now. So how long will it take to, to get those questions answered that you just asked? All I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, is that we are uh, holding people accountable now to meet those standards, and we are working towards getting to uh, each of those sites that meet the standards. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence. I just think, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, and Mr. Ranking Member, I, I really think we have to set some deadlines. Because other than that, we will be hearing this over and over and over again. And I, I just hope that we can do that in a bipartisan way where we can get to the bottom of this. Mr. Chairman, yield, or, the Chairman, allow me to make a statement on that. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I think we are maybe yelling at the wrong people here uh, on that. Um, when we had the hearing out at Walter Reed, when this thing first broke, uh, we, we wanted to hold the people at the top accountable, uh, not necessarily the people that are out there slugging away every day trying to get these things done and taking the heat on that. Uh, we had the hearing in March of 2007. Uh, the Army Surgeon General, who was the top Army officer responsible for the failures out there, resigned. Uh, that was followed by the Commander of Walter Reed, the Army Secretary. They resigned. And in July of 2007, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. I suggest, Mr. Chairman, at the next hearing, we don't keep pestering this group of people who are out there working, trying to take orders or anything like that. We kick it up a notch. Uh, and we have some accountability for the people uh, that are supposed to be. So, you know, we found out the Army, the Surgeon General, lived across from Walter Reed. So he was a surgeon, he was a member of the services, and he was a neighbor and hasn't visited. I mean, these things are just unacceptable. And to keep, you know, forcing these folks, the good folks, to come in front of us and explain what's going wrong, uh, they can only do so much unless somebody at the top takes responsibility for working out these things. And, and if a large part of it is personnel, then these folks aren't necessarily going to be able to make that decision. Somebody has got to call to Congress's attention that we need X amount of dollars for the following personnel. They have to be assigned to the following locations and move it on. So I, my respectful recommendation is that we consider bringing in folks at the top level decision-making thing and holding them responsible. And I think the American people have the same response. They will require some accountability on this. I, I, would, uh, I would concur with the, both the ranking member and Mr. Cummings <laughs> as well. I, 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 While well, I appreciate the two people that have been here testifying today, it is an embarrassment, embarrassment to the Veterans Affairs, it is an embarrassment to the Department of Defense to not send the most senior most people to this committee. They owe these responses to the American people. I would hope we could work in a bipartisan way. If we have to issue subpoenas to get them here, we will issue subpoenas. But to have people come here that aren't even in the meeting on May 2nd with all due respect, is an embarrassment to those two agencies. We need answers. This has gone on for, for years and years and years. And no longer will this committee put up with the tolerance of just saying, well, we are putting together and we are having meetings. It is not acceptable. It is absolutely not acceptable. We will work together in a bipartisan way to make that happen. And I, I totally concur with the comments that were just made here. We now like to recognize a member of our full committee, uh, Ms. Burkle from New York. Uh, she is also the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Health, and we will recognize her for a very lenient five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to participate in this hearing this morning. I come here as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Health for Veteran Affairs, and I sit here this morning appalled at what I am hearing. And as was echoed by my colleagues, we can't hold you accountable, but we can hold the Veterans Administration and DOD. This is shameful. This is absolutely shameful. Our men and women provide and protect, protect us 
And, and the very least we can do is when they come home, we can provide them with the services and, and the, the health care that they need. So I'm trying to understand what, what happened here. Um, in 2007, we identified problems. And then were there parallel systems? And now, as of March, there will be an integrated system? Is, is that, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Well, I think we had a, what we termed the legacy disability evaluation system, which the DOD used to uh, put a service member through who was going to be determined unfit. And then they were separated from the service. At that point, then, they filed a claim with the VA. So they had a medical examination under DOD. They were separated. They came to the VA and they went through another medical examination in order to get a rating. What we have done since we have started both the pilot and now the full implementation is integrate both of those processes so as a service member is identified as potentially being unfit for service, when they get into this process, they are then uh, given one, we call it one medical exam, but it is composed of a number of them because they may have a number of, of things on the uh, issues that are, make them unfit for continued service. At the same time, we also uh, catalog all those things of which is service-connected for them. So we are doing all those examinations at one time. Once those are done, then the uh, record is sent to, uh, to the VA for a disability rating for us, and at the same time, uh, sent to um, the DOD for an evaluation on the unfitting conditions that would, would do that. So okay. th that is happening now, but we still have a, a, <coughs> a mix, mixture of both legacy and the new system in place. And so earlier, Mr. Byrd, you testified that when, when a veteran downloads their medical record, they will at least get the pharmaceutical portion and then any other information that they may have entered into the system. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And so we are then asking someone, so, so their laboratory results aren't in there, physical examination, any, any um, examinations conducted by a physician, if they downloaded their medical records, all they are getting are those two components? That, yes, that is correct. Okay. Does anybody realize? how ineffective and inefficient that is, how that just doesn't work. We just had a vet here sitting in, in this committee download her, her medical records, healthy vet. And all she got when she downloaded her medical records was her name and address and anything she entered into that record. She didn't choose to enter her blood type in, so that didn't show up. So it sounds to me like we haven't made a whole lot of progress. And what I hear from the veterans over and over and over again is they can't get process out. They are in such a hurry because this process takes so long. They are in such a hurry that they just they, they wash their hands of it and they just move on because they want to go spend time with their family and process out. This isn't some theoretical problem we have here. This is very real. And I echo um, my trip to Walter Reed and to Bethesda and the suffering that these veterans are going through, the very least this nation can do, the very least is to get this process up and running and help them facilitate their discharge from their service to this country. It's, I was an attorney and represented a large teaching hospital. We integrated electronic medical records. The whole world is doing it. The Department of Defense and Veteran Affairs and Veteran Administration should be able to do it. We have got the resources. You have got bipartisan, bipartisan support that you don't get anywhere else. When it comes to our veterans and our military, there is bipartisan support. There is no reason why we shouldn't be able to do this. I agree with my colleague. We need to set a time frame. We need to get a timeline. And we need to hold, and, and as I will echo what was said, we need to hold leadership responsible. I realize you folks are here just testifying, but we, re we need to hold leadership responsible because this is not theoretical. These are very real people, real <laughs> veterans, and they are really <laughs> suffering. I, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, let me make sure I have these numbers right. Uh, the processing was taking about uh, 540 days. 
but I believe it was Mr. Bertoni, did you say that now it, that is now back up to 394? The goal was, I believe the number, I, the number I wrote down during part of the testimony, I believe, was 394 days is the average time. Yes, under the legacy system, they calculated 540-day total processing time um, from referral to VA benefits. Right now, or as of March 31st, they're at 394 for active. And if you're a Marine, you're at 455 days. So these numbers are quickly closing in on the, the 540. How, how do you explain this? I, and it, this is, you have a family whose loved one has been serving overseas. It takes over a year to get them through the process and get them a check. Like, what, what would you say to those, those veterans and their families? Ms. Simpson, go ahead. I don't think there's anything we can say that would make their situation better. Um, I, was not a, I regret that I was not aware that the average time had gotten that high. Um, now, how is that? I mean, that scares me unto itself. I, I appreciate your candor. I think you are right. I don't think there is an excuse anymore. This is, this, these reports that came out in 2004 and then in 2007, and then we are going to have a meeting. And, mm -hmm. and I realize you are in the hot seat, and it is much bigger and broader than just you, but you can understand why we are so infuriated. We are going backwards at this point. Mr. Medvey? Mr. Chairman, all I can tell you is, you know, I it is my responsibility, because I am part of the team, to ensure that we Were you at the meeting on May 2nd? I was. What was said? What were what the conclusions? Well, I mean, the, the two topics they covered were uh, IDS and uh, electronic health records. Um, and there is uh, commitment by both secretaries to uh, improve IDS and to work towards a uh, So they sat down and said, we are committed to this, just like they had said before. There had to be some more detail or goals or, or particulars that came out of that meeting. We have been charged with, with getting the system uh, more more efficient and effective and get these but, but that was the goal before, was it not? Come on, there had to be something new that came out of this. When is this thing going to work? Fully work? Like when can you when you can say this thing works? Mr. Chairman, I, I can't give you a specific date. What with you're in the meeting with the secretaries, we expect to hear under an understanding of what the conclusion of that was. You have no specifics to share with us but, as to what that was said? Mr. Chairman, I, how long did the meeting last? An hour. What specifics came out of that meeting? I, I got to believe that two secretaries in the midst of tackling Osama bin Laden came up with some sort of conclusions and didn't just waste their time in, in this meeting. Mr. Chairman, they're, they're, we're working towards uh, getting this system for IDS uh, as good as we can get it. That's the, the commitment. And we're now, one of the goals that the secretaries put out is that they wanted to reduce the waiting time to 75 to 150 days. How in the world did they come up with that? We are still over a year, and the number is sliding backwards. How did they come to that, that conclusion? Sure, that is an aspirational. There, we are looking closely at what we can actually achieve in terms of time, because embedded in this total time, you do have appellate rights for the service members. You have got uh, transition leave. I didn't come up with the goal. They did. Yeah. When would we expect, when can servicemen and women expect that we would meet the goal laid out by Secretaries Gate and Shinseki? I can't give you a specific date, Mr. Chairman. Can you give me a year? We are, we are committed to come up with recommendations. The answer is no, isn't it? The answer is no. And that's, that's the frustration. You can't even tell me what year we think we are going to accomplish this. And as, as was pointed out here earlier, you know, we could uh, I, don't, I am beyond words to understand why this is taking so long. We were chatting, and, and, and maybe one of the things we should do is, what if we went back and just photocopied the records and put them on three by five cards? Would that speed up the process at this point? Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, if there is an impression that there aren't records, I mean, we trans No, there's records. They just can't seem to talk to each other. You can't get them to go from the DOD to the VA. Well, I mean, we do have, when a service member transitions out to veteran standards, they are electronic versions of, of what they have in their medical records are sent to a data warehouse that the VA can access if, you're in, if you apply for a uh, uh, We will get through the minutia. It scares me that you cannot even tell me what year we think we are getting to these quote, unquote, aspirational days. I think the, the servicemen and women are being misled. 
in this understanding that this is accelerating, when the reality is the numbers are getting worse, the wait times are getting worse, and that we can't even, that we have meetings with the Cabinet Secretaries that last for an hour and they have aspirational goals, oh, it's going to get better. Well, it's not getting better, and that's why we need some more definitive answers. I will uh, over my time, and I will yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And before I forget, Mr. Chairman, may I ask the you unanimous know, consent that my opening statement be submitted on the record? Absolutely. Thank you. I would like to move on to, um, to how we are going to resolve this, uh, if we can. So um, have we, and anybody that feels qualified can answer this, have we identified all of the technical problems that exist in this system? And have we identified all of the personnel problems and whatever other problems are there? Do we know where the problems lie? We have identified those areas resource-wise, facility-wise, and all that, that that we examine prior to any site going into the new process. Uh, we have actually held up sites because they either didn't have the right number of personnel or the right number of facilities uh, because they weren't ready. So, yes, I think we have got You think we know what the challenges are, and if we, we solve those challenges, challenges we will be doing better. As we are moving forward with implementation, we are holding people to those standards and we are not moving them into it until they are ready. So is there a plan for each of those areas and how are you going to go about solving the technology problems, how are you going to go about solving the personnel problems, or whatever? Is there a large plan on that, overlying plan? There, there is a, each site develops their own uh, assessment. They develop their own uh, concept plan of how to deal but with But I would hope there is somebody a step up from that making sure that each side does and, that. And that's, a, there, there are, absolutely. Who is responsible for that? Who is the ultimate go-to person that uh, anybody would go to for an answer or to report the progress on each of these sites? Uh, the, each one of these sites are briefed to both deputy secretaries in the uh, Senior Oversight Council. And do those deputy secretaries have the final say in what software is used, what uh, hardware is used, the numbers of personnel that are hired, and where they are situated? They don't get to that level of detail but because each of the services and the VA has their responsibility. So you think the decision making all that stops at a level lower than that? I think, it, yes, in terms of the recommendations for that, what gets briefed to the deputy secretaries are, are you on target? Do you have the number right. so of resources? So it is back to the deputy secretaries. They know what the targets are and right. it is their responsibility to hold but people accountable. But I thought you were asking, you know, number of computers and that sort of thing. No, no, no. But I, I want the level of person that says, you know, have you solved this problem in hardware? Have you solved this problem in software? Have you got the right personnel that in the right brief. place? Are we deciding whether it is cheaper to fly these people to a central location, get all the myriad physical and mental exams, or is it better to try to have that kind of personnel available at the site? Those types of things, it is at deputy secretary yeah, level. Those are, those are brief during the SOC. Okay. Uh, and we think we have identified what the challenges are, that now just somebody has to monitor it for implementation uh, and, to, and resolution. Yes, sir, and that is where I think we are at now. Okay. And we know which services, which service branches aren't doing as well as others. Yes. For instance, Air Force is not doing as well as Army. Correct. I mean, one of the things that disturbed me in, in reading this was that when we didn't meet the goals, instead of deciding how we were going to meet them, we lowered the goal. I, mean, I don't think that is the preferred path here, and I, I hope it is going to be reversed on that. So. If we really wanted an answer, instead of pounding it, you and Ms. Simpson, it uh, would be better to go to the deputy secretaries and find out just how much they are writing this. It seems to me if you really want to prioritize something and you think this is the important thing, then the deputy secretary would be having a meeting every week, not every quarter or every half year, but every week, asking the responsible people you know, that they re the report to them just where are we on this and why aren't we further along. Does that sound reasonable if we were to question those folks? I think you can be assured that we are having those accountability meetings at a variety of levels uh, currently. Okay. Do you have access to whatever kind of technical expertise you think you might need? In other words, outside uh, computer analysts, computer specialists, computer uh, entrepreneurs or whatever, like, are you able to resource those people and get them in to discuss with you some of the larger, more technical problems that you might be having challenges with? I, I can't speak for our IT people, but I mean, we have set up uh, work groups to look at the technical challenges for the existing IT systems we have got supporting this to see where we can improve it. And those support groups go outside of just what we have in the Department of Defense and the VA. We use other, uh, other people as well. I, I would assume so. What recommendations would you have for this committee in terms of 
how would we best drill down on this and get ourselves an answer as to when we could expect this thing to be moving smoothly? All I can tell you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, is that uh, you know, we are committed to implementing this through the rest of the FY. As you know, each case takes a number of times, so in terms of getting more data, the, the uh, sites we are bringing online now are, at least, even if we hit our goal, 295 down, days down the line until we have any data in order to see if they are on target or off target. With, with terms of the whole process, we can start to get glimpses in terms of how long it's taken to do the exams and, and those incremental pieces. But uh, it, you know, it does take a while. I, I understand the implications of each case and, and how sensitive that is. But, Mr. Pertoni, do you get the feel that, that there is some sort of systematic approach to this, that somebody has got an overarching plan? Uh, to get this resolved on the, on the level of systems and plans as opposed to the individual cases? I, I testified in December that uh, right. I had not seen a, a, what I would call a service delivery plan that puts all these pieces together. Exactly. Um, would that be great for us to, to get our hands on and to assess? Absolutely. Who do you think would be responsible for doing that from your vantage point when you look at what is being done and who is responsible for what over I, there? Who, who would you look to for that? I think there are some very talented people at DOD and VA that we have been working with that know this program, know the data, and that's, uh, those folks would be the, fo the people to do that. And who do they answer to? Mr. Medby, for one. <laughs> okay, Mr. Medby. And, and who do you answer to? Sir, I, I answer to the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Policy. The Assistant Secretary? Oh, I'm what? sorry. The assist yes, Assistant Secretary. Okay. And that person re uh, reports, reports to the Deputy? To the deputy secretary. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. I would like to just maybe go down the row here and just uh, one last thing. I, I want you to, I, I want to be very crystal clear, just to sink simple, the biggest problems and challenges that you see um, and the recommendation or suggestion of what we need to have happen. What I would like to do is start with Ms. Ms. Simpson, Mr. Medvey, then go to Mr. Williamson, Mr. Byrd, and end on Mr. Bertoni, if we could, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My understanding is that the um, access to data, making sure that information is uh, accurate, valid, and succinct, and, um, and that the uh, metrics are, account are held to. That is one thing. Second thing, to take a look at each of the sites at each step in the process and find out what specifically is going on to account for the length of time. Um, I knew it was higher than 295, but I wasn't aware it was that high that was just mentioned earlier. And then the uh, follow-up that is required to actually get to the place of the electronic health record, that we have very senior IT specialists who have reach-back capability to, to um, outside experts, outside of the Federal Government, to be able to provide that foundation to use as records. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would echo what Ms. Simpson said in terms of uh, the process. You know, we are taking a hard look at uh, ensuring that uh, we have got the requisite amount of uh, medical personnel and uh, outsourced personnel to do that, and we are also uh, monitoring that very closely uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we, don't, we have what the required number. Uh, you know, I am happy to come back again uh, as we move through this implementation to show you how things are going and to uh, uh, brief the staff. Thank you. Mr. Williamson. I would say from my standpoint that it is IT issues associated with the Wounded Warrior programs that would allow them to communicate and talk with one another. Uh, without that, you are going to get confusion and consternation and conflicting kinds of recovery plans um, for our veterans and service members. How, how close or how, how bad is the problem and how close are we to solving it? We are a ways away. There are some things that are going on uh, right now in terms of the Federal Recovery Coordination Program. But it requires that's a VA program, but it requires DOD cooperation. You have the same thing you've been talking about throughout here. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Developing large-scale IT solutions is challenging enough for anybody. The Department of Defense has capabilities, and VA has capabilities. They need to establish joint 
capabilities to tackle some of these large scale problems. Have they problems started that, that process? <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, they, they started over 10 years ago, and they've, they have frankly slowly been in, increasing their capabilities as well as increasing their capabilities to work together to tackle some of the challenges. But we are nowhere close to getting to the finish line. Uh, the, it's it's <clears throat> difficult to say because the finish line is, has not yet has not been defined. Who, who, who should define that? Who should define the finish line? Well, the departments should, should define the finish so the line. The secretaries is what we need to hold. That is encouraging. Uh, Mr. Bertoni, I think over the last several years we have identified specific challenges I think that have impacted this program negatively. And to DOD and VA's credit, I think they have tried to get in front of many of those, in, in particular the issue of standing up sites, readiness, looking lookbacks, making sure that, that down the road they are going to have appropriate staff in play. Um, but beyond that, I think there needs to be additional data collection. At, the, at a more granular level. You need to know at particular site level, local like, locations, what are your ratios looking like? What are the problems with the diagnoses, problems with exam summaries? Those are the things you need to know that are, that are bogging the system down. And right now, that capability is not there. So that is something that we definitely would see them do more uh, granular data analysis and collection and monitoring so they can make the adjustments. Uh, in this way, you can get in front of problems. You don't have to wait until you are 295 days down the road to say, we have got a problem with ratings, we have got a problem with exam summaries. But if you start to see this emerging, you can make the adjustments, you can apply the training, and you can apply the technology to get in front of those problems. Thank you. I, I want to thank you all for your participation. I know your heart is in, in, right, in the right spot on all of these things. It is terribly frustrating. It is terribly frustrating. These men and women, the, our American military does amazing things, and we just saw that play out. But when it comes time, when they come home to take care of them, we are failing. And it's about time that we, at the secretary level, at the presidential level, that we get somebody who is irate that can actually move the ball forward and do some things to actually make this thing happen. I know that members on this committee, I know Mr. Tierney has worked tirelessly on this. I will continue to pour my, my efforts into it. But we have got to demand that we actually achieve these goals. And that is going to take some serious leadership, and I think that leadership is, is lacking at the highest levels within the Department of Defense and within the, the, the Veterans Administration. I thank you all again for your, your, your information. You are pouring your hearts, like I said, in the, in the right direction. Uh, we look forward. Unfortunately, we will be having another one of these, uh, uh, these hearings again. But hopefully the news will be better and we will be making more progress. Thank you again for your, your expertise and your testimony today. The committee stands adjourned.